It's time for this week's Prairie Cast. This week's Prairie Cast is brought to you by Delta Dental of Iowa, who reminds you that you don't have to work for a big company to get big benefits. Delta Dental offers a dental plan to fit your needs. Whether it is a single policy, one for your family, or one for the team at your startup, visit DeltaDentalIA.com to learn more about your many plan options. Hi there, and welcome to episode 74 of PrairieCast for February 14th, 2012. I'm Jeff Wood of Silicon Prairie News, and our panel today includes Chris Snyder, a multimedia journalism professor at Drake University here in Des Moines. He's with us in studio, and also Thad Langford, who's the executive in residence at Open Air Equity Partners in Kansas City, and Thad joins us via Skype. Gentlemen, how are you today? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Good. Dad? Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming on and making time for us today. We're starting a few minutes late, so uh, uh, I think we have everything kind of solved technical-wise. And of course, I guess I left you off the, the panel. <laughs> well, Co-host Andy Brukel of 48 Web, uh, who sacrificed his laptop yes. for, for <laughs> new tech here in, in the last few minutes we before the show. PC problem. Notice all the Macs are working fine. <laughs> yeah, well... Hey, we have some good Windows-based partners for <laughs> I know. Very new, yeah. so leave that alone. <laughs> I, I use Windows, too. Um, well, before we get started, we just got some breaking news from our in-studio audience that Tickly, a Des Moines-based ticketing startup, is having their launch party next Wednesday, 5.30 p.m. at Vaudeville Muse. So you're hearing that first on uh, PrairieCast. If you'd like to do that, check it out or, or hit up Emma and Brian, uh, the two people behind Tickly, and learn more about it. That's two weeks in a row that we've had breaking news yeah. on PrairieCast. Last week, we learned that Smarty Pig opened an India office, and this week, Tickly's going to have a party. Yes. So, uh, very We're good. always breaking news here. Chris, uh, start with, with you a little bit. You guys, um, and I want to talk about this more in the fast forward, but, but one reason I wanted to have you on this week is that your class did something pretty unique for Des Moines uh, with the company Foursquare, and, and why don't you tell us about the project? I don't want to give it away. Tell us about <laughs> okay. the project. Uh, I teach a social media strategies class at Drake University, and this is actually the first time we've taught that class, first time we've offered it. And one of the students found, you know, a week into the class, found that Foursquare was having a contest to give away three badges to cities who create whatever they deem to be the kind of best list on Foursquare. We didn't even really know exactly what the requirements were. They said, create a list, get people to tweet about it, get a lot of people to follow the list. Um, and so, you know, one of our, our, the class brainstorm created a list, you know, worked out to get people to follow it. And we just found out last week, I guess, that we were one of, and one of five cities to get a Foursquare badge. So originally they said three, expanded it to five, but, you know, kind of cool that they picked Des Moines uh, the, the, this class got to have the experience of doing that and really, you know, kind of helped, I think, connect that class to, to Des Moines a little more tightly. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Thad, I know that KC was on the almost made it list. So uh, you guys did, did not get this time, <laughs> I'm sure, in the future. Um, are you a Foursquare user, Thad? Uh, I am not. Not a regular user. Okay. It's, uh, I've been a user, I think, since they opened it up nationwide. Uh, we talked a little bit a couple weeks ago that um, when Foursquare was going city by city releasing this, Des Moines was not on their list, and a few of us campaigned for it and did not get in. So I was, <laughs> I was miffed at Foursquare, but maybe this makes it all better. Yeah. So, yeah, hopefully. It'll be uh, you know, cool to see now what, what they put on the badge. Yeah. Abs- do you guys get to decide that? Well, we, uh, we got to send in some suggestions. Just don't be they... a corn stalker. Or like that, please. <laughs> is, it, is it agricultural? <laughs> did, tell me that's not your suggestions. No. Okay. We, we just got to send them in. So, okay. you know, one, one of them may have been state fair related. but Well, I guess <laughs> that's, that's all right. That's, that's pretty characteristic. Fried of snicker on a stick, perhaps. <laughs> they, That'd be a good one. They were, uh, in their blog post, they included a picture uh, from Zombie Burger of zombies taking over Des Moines. So. I, I think they even mentioned that. Well, actually, I have the text right here. They said they were super impressed by the Des Moines City list made by Drake University Social Media Strategies class. They joined forces to write a bunch of great tips, get the word out, and got over 250 followers. Their list includes fairgrounds, zombie burger joints, delicious cornbread, and more. So maybe those will, one of those will show up on the badge. Yeah, you, well, we'll see. You, you just wonder what kind of put them over the top. Just, they, they seem to latch onto that zombie burger thing. So <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe it's good worldwide press for zombie burger. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. <laughs> Um, I do want to point out that in our Fast Four segment a couple weeks ago, our editor, Michael Stacy said, uh, I asked whether or not Dwayne would get this list, uh, get a four square badge, and he said no. So anything you want to say to Michael who doubted your uh, ability to do this? Well, uh, for a while there, I was right there with you. I was a little surprised when I, you know, someone, someone saw it on a blog post and sent me a tweet, and I was just like, whoa, this really happened. You know, I, I think it was a good story to tell. I mean, good job by these students to really get the word out, to, to get their friends to sign up for Foursquare. I mean, it's too good of a story to pass up for Foursquare. So, you know, good for, 
for seeing that and, and giving us the badge. So not even any official notice. You just saw the post when everybody else did. Yeah, okay. yeah. It, well, I mean, Hillary Hennick, who made made the list, who's in the class, got an email, but I don't even know what the timing was of that email. So. Okay, very cool. Uh, I'm excited to see what it is and, and when it gets out there. And no time frame yet on when. We it don't is. know. We don't know. We'll see. Okay, very cool. It definitely shows what a focused effort will do, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I think this was a larger, like, nationwide project that, was it a, a White House challenge to visit, like, find in interesting things to visit across the United States, and Foursquare kind of picked that up and said, let's see what cities can do as far as putting that together. Yeah, because everything had the hashtag visit US, so kind of tied in this initiative maybe to get more tourism going, so, you know, come to Des Moines, visit Des Moines. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't been here, and I don't know why you wouldn't be, but come, come visit us and, uh, and check it out. Let's, uh, let's go into the next story of, of the week, and we'll come back to the Foursquare badge and the Fast Four as well. But um, I want to talk about Leap2, and this is one of the reasons why Thad is joining us today. <coughs> Excuse me. Leap2 is a mobile search browser product from a Kansas City-based startup of the same name. They launched on iPhone in November and now are live on Android, and that's kind of what prompted the news this week. In addition to launching on Android, they announced a seed round of $280,000 that includes investment from two former Sprint executives, Thad, you are one of them, as well as Aaron McKee, um, and that, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Leap2 is and why you were interested in, um, in working in, you know, putting your investment into this project. Yeah, there are a couple reasons. Um, you know, first and foremost, it's a huge opportunity. So, you know, mobile search uh, needs, you know, has a problem. The usability on search, you know, today is primarily just PC, taking the PC experience and pull it on the mobile. And it doesn't work very well. So, you know, still creating the same, you still pull up the same links. Uh, you go in and out uh, of those links, and it just begs for a much better experience. And that's exactly what Leap2 is uh, aiming to do. And I think they've done really well in these first iterations, and the, the future versions, I'm sure, will continue to address that. So, you know, having that big market out there and a big problem to solve, I'm a big believer in that. Whenever there's a big problem to solve, um, you know, there's usually uh, it, it's ripe for opportunity for somebody to go to go make that happen. Um, and then just from a market size perspective, you know, the mobile search advertising space is, is enormous. So um, I think last year I saw eMarketer, I think it was $650 million in revenue uh, coming from mobile search advertising. I think they're predicting it to, uh, to go to roughly $1.3 billion uh, in 2012. So, um, so certainly that's a, that's a key factor in why I was getting involved and, I, and with my background and wireless experience. Uh, definitely matched a lot of the contacts and connections and knowledge that I have in the space. Um, you know, the third component, as always, is the entrepreneur behind the kind of the madman behind the scenes coming up with all of the ideas and, mm -hmm. and uh, figuring out how to make it work. And uh, Mike Farmer is the, uh, is the founder and CEO there. And he's just one of those crazy, brilliant guys that you want to be involved with. And uh, we work very well together, um, you know, trying to move this business forward. So I think it's really exciting, great opportunity. Um, a lot of big players in this space, so it's uh, high risk, high reward, but uh, but it's definitely something I think is right for uh, right for the picking. Yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting um, app itself. Have you tried it? Have you I, had have, a chance? I have. Um, Andy, have you seen it? I have not. Uh... Uh, no, that's, you have the ancient iPhone yeah, that really uh, do doesn't apps. run any apps. Um, the uh, yeah, what I like about it is it, it really transforms kind of the the search experience and then the results. So you're not looking at a list of results. You you can categorize like I'm interested in looking at local. I'm interested in looking at maps, and kind of it's it's all like spinning wheels like you have on the iPhone that, that lets you uh, navigate to those. So I haven't actually used it out in the field, but kind of in prepping for the show was looking at it, and I and I think it definitely is a different take and. I'm interested, uh, you know, it makes me think a little bit of uh, Torsion Mobile's mm -hmm. Mo Mojava product, which we just ran, that they launched yesterday, um, where they're really saying uh, there is innovation, or there's room in this space for things that are designed specifically for the mobile experience and not just repackaging the desktop experience. Chris, did you have some thoughts? Yeah, you know, uh, you know I enjoyed using it. It's, it's a different search experience. I think it's going to take you a while to adjust to the way that is, and, you know, and maybe that experience will change over time, too, in, in the way it's used, but, you know, for me, you know, something that's happened, I have a five month, five month old kid. And so as soon as he was born, pretty much my iPad and my <laughs> laptop were gone because I needed something I could just hold in one hand because I'm always doing something with the other hand with, with the kids. So, you know, mobiles become important and search has been one of those things that you're right. It's the same experience on a desktop. And so, you know, something better is out there. Now I don't have Siri yet. So maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the something better. So that's, that's the thing I thought about first when I, when I tried out this, 
this app. Yeah, it was to be able to actually talk to it and 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 have it. Right. Well, it, you say, know, and is yeah. it competing with Siri then? And, and how do you compete with 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 an, an Apple product like that? that, that yeah, is, it has a it has a voice uh, it has a voice in, input component to it. So. Um, uh, on the Android version, and so uh, if you have Android, it's it's a bit of a different experience. There's a new iOS version that will be coming out shortly, um, I think this week or maybe early next week. But um, but you know the two the two primary components here are trying to get people to your to your result as fast as possible, so get it directly there. And then this whole idea behind a mobile search browser is to also be able to give you different areas, different topics to go to that may be relevant to your search terms uh, to be able to get to very quickly, and then um, uh, so it kind of combines this idea of getting directly to your uh, result, but then also has this browsing, serendipity of browsing included in it. So yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask you, um, when he comes to you, and he, I mean, maybe you're helping out as an, an advisory role, and he says, we're going to take on Google and search and advertising. What did you say? Like, were you just like, this is a horrible idea? Or do you say, well, let's see how we can make this work? No, it's actually le it's, it's less about who's involved because, uh, you know, for me, when there are big companies involved, again, it's kind of ripe for opportunity, um, either to partner with those companies. Um, certainly at the end of the day, those companies are very interested in creating a better search experience also. So you never know what kind of interesting conversations can take place uh, at the end of the day. But the bottom line is, you know, trying to create just the best mobile search experience possible uh, for users and just, you know, create that experience. Um, because number one is you got to get people to use it and then use it over and over again. You know, what we've seen with mobile apps, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys have uh, probably had this experience too. Really easy to get in and experiment with an app, but how many apps do you actually continue to go back and use over and over again? And so, you know, the approach that Mike has taken, and this is where his, uh, you know, his kind of madman, uh, brilliant thinking side comes into play, you know, he's really building this broad platform out. So. Um, you know, it won't be just on mobile, but it'll also be trying to figure out how to incorporate, take some of those key learnings at mobile, and maybe even take it back over to a PC experience. Um, so there's uh, he has a he has a great product roadmap laid out, and uh, it'll be very interesting. Yeah, that that will be interesting. Um, and that was actually one of the thoughts that I had was, uh, Chris, and you can talk about this from the social media experience that your classes had, but it seems like we're seeing more and more tools that are coming out mobile first as as opposed to desktop first and and things like the one that keeps popping up in my head is path right that that social network it's all mobile right. and it's actually annoyingly mobile sometimes mm -hmm. if you open up the email that somebody wants to be your friend on that inside a browser it says go to your phone and, and do and which is kind of annoying but um, I don't think path ever intends to go to desktop it will always be mobile I was curious if leap 2 will always be mobile but it sounds like there is some plans to to come back to desktop potentially in the future I think it's I think you know some interesting possibilities on how to integrate mobile and make the PC experience better uh, through the use of mobile. So there are definitely some key learnings on you know the interface in mobile and trying to do something on a much smaller screen. Um, but I think there's also this idea of integrating a mobile experience into the PC. Uh, there are just some really interesting ideas and possibilities there. So you know I would not view you know Leap Two certainly has started out kind of from an app standpoint. Um, but really the idea and the vision here is to build out a very broad platform uh, to be able to integrate it across a lot, you know, a lot of different touch points, um, tablets, PC, uh, really anything, any digital interface. Well, you know, I mean, just in terms of the, the idea of using mobile first that you brought up, Jeff, you know, this semester I, I have noticed a change. I think, you know, the my multimedia class, they had to research how some celebrities were using social media and half the class just immediately went to their phones and I'm I just look at them like I'm like no you have to log in the computers and research how they're using social media you're not texting your friends right now uh, and they just show me their phones like no that's what we're doing right here so you know this this younger generation is just think, I mean that's just the way they think now is it's mobile they don't even think about the desktop necessarily so I mean I, that was the first time I saw that huge change this semester and that just comparing it to even last year, right yeah. prior semester yeah, so, yeah that, that is uh, uh, something I think we'll see, and I think that's more globally acceptable too. Um, you know, outside oh, yeah. of this. So as you expand, uh, uh, is is Leap Two only in English at this point, or is it set up for other languages? At this point, at this point. Okay. Um, yeah, really uh, interested to see where it goes. One other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, you know, you had were you the founder of Zave Networks? I was not. I was not. I was the president and CEO. I came okay. out about a year after the company was founded. Okay, and, and Zave Networks, for those who, who don't remember, um, exited 
to Google. It was acquired by Google in the last six months. I guess I don't have the specific date in front of me, um, but I'm really excited to see that that not only did that happen, but but you and your other colleagues that were at Zave Networks are now investing um, in other companies and kind of seeing that innovation cycle flow in Kansas City of, you know, there is an exit and some cash comes in um, to people's pockets, I guess, and then it goes out then. You want to talk a little bit about what you see related to that in Kansas City and, and um, how things have gone since Zave uh, had the acquisition? Yeah, sure. So uh, since the acquisition, you know, my my uh, thought was to really kind of get back into Kansas City because whenever you're running a company, as most entrepreneurs know, your head is down and, you know, you are focused solely on what you are doing. And so that was certainly the case for me. And then uh, so coming out of the exit of Zave, you know, I'd heard about all the entrepreneurial activity going on. But quite frankly, there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, connectedness, if you will, kind of amongst the entrepreneurs. And so, uh, so I've really just kind of immersed myself in the, a lot of different things going on around here, both from, you know, we have a big five initiative from the Chamber of Commerce to make Kansas City one of the most entrepreneurial cities. Uh, Kauffman Foundation is here, uh, obviously Google Fiber Project. And then there is a, there are a tremendous amount of startups um, that are here in Kansas City and founded in Kansas City uh, with some really good ideas and obviously Leap2 being one of them, but there's a laundry list uh, Ag Local, Clink Mobile, In Concert, I Verify, and the list kind of goes on and on. And so for me, it's really exciting to come out and have a lot of you know great learnings over the past you know three and a half years uh, with Zave, and to be able to help you know other entrepreneurs build their ideas, grow their ideas. Um, with my corporate experience with Sprint, with a lot of different you know contacts and you know different uh, different larger companies. Um, you know, the hope is to connect them in to possibly their first customer uh, or hopefully, you know, at the, uh, as they build their businesses, you know, potential uh, suitors uh, for the, uh, you know, for the, for the companies that they're building. I'd say, you know, what I really would like to see is, you know, there are a lot of uh, large corporations in Kansas City. Uh, you know, I would challenge uh, the executives in those, uh, in those companies to take a look at the local companies uh, and figure out, all right, you know, really kind of help support them, you know, either from an advisory role, a mentoring role, be the first customer. Uh, that is really, I think, a key part of building out a real uh, vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. I don't know what you guys are seeing uh, up there, but, uh, but here, you know, it's starting to, you know, manifest itself that way, but uh, we, we need a heck of a lot more of it. Yeah, I, I would I would think it's the same in Des Moines from what I've seen in the almost three years that we've kind of been uh, <clears throat> working on Silicon Prairie News in this city. And obviously, it, the people have been working on the entrepreneurial ecosystem here for much longer than that. But we see people um, that are starting to do that. We haven't seen a lot of people that have exited their companies and put money back into the ecosystem yet. I think more lack of exits to do that than there is interest. I think there are lots of companies now that if they get to the point that they can exit that they want to do that but uh, it's exciting to see it there in Kansas City um, and and then there are always efforts going on in, in, in this city of trying to connect um, people to kind of buy local and, and do that like there the, the partnership which is um, the Des Moines version of the Kansas City Chamber uh, it really has a they call it buy into the circle a big initiative they push and I see a lot of entrepreneurs trying to reach into that and say it's not just um, you know, source your materials yeah. locally, but also look at, you know, uh, doing your payments locally or investing, you know, those types of things and, and kind of capitalize on those initiatives that exist. Any of this kind of reach into to your class and what, what you guys are talking about? Uh, you know, I mean, hopefully, hopefully some entrepreneurial spirit strikes. Students. You know, I think that's, that's kind of the big thing. And it, you know, actually one of our, one of our grads went to your guys, your, uh, startup bar crawl is that what, or startup crawl. Uh, and, job crawl, yeah. yeah, job crawl, bar yeah. crawl, yeah. <laughs> and and got it, got a job. So someone with a journalism major to work it into a startup. So I thought that was kind of cool. I just well, well, you guys had the story. That I saw. Yeah, that um, Rianne is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rianne uh, did wrote a, a nice story on that. We'll talk a little bit more about the startup job crawl uh, later in the show as well. But but yeah, I think that's an also also a piece of that is hiring locally and kind of giving mm -hmm. grads coming into the market. Or even uh, we had uh, an intern here that I know that was just a. Uh, watching the show and yep. he interns with three or four different startups here. So kind of connecting that way is, uh, is important as well. Um, one more point before we move on uh, to the next segment of the show, but uh, Thad in Kansas city, uh, kind of reaching back into your sprint experience um, is Kansas city becoming a little bit of a hub for mobile startups. I would think with the presence of sprint there and the talent that has been brought in for sprint, that a lot of that can come back out and, and leap to and yourself and people like that are, are some of the first signs of that. Would you agree? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, it definitely you know, there's a tremendous amount of talent both inside of Sprint and in other large corporations here, but also outside of Sprint. You know, they've um, you know a lot of changes have occurred uh, within uh, some of those companies, and it definitely um, you know it wasn't for a lack of talent uh, internally, that's for sure. So there's a lot of engineering talent. Uh, there's a lot of management talent um, that's out there, and uh, yeah, I think it's really kind of spawned uh, a lot of different uh, companies. Um, but I think you know that that talent's coming from all over. It's you know it, it, not just internally from these companies, but also from some of the universities, uh, et cetera. I mean, as you guys know, you know that talent comes from all over, and it's important for entrepreneurs to come from you know different backgrounds and uh, different companies, different industries. Uh, and quite frankly, different experience levels uh, as well, because everybody approaches things a little differently. Do you see, uh, Danny Schreiber asked in the chat room, um, do you see Garmin and Cerner kind of uh, spinning out employees into startups as well, like we're seeing with Sprint? Yeah, you know what, I haven't seen as many. Um, and, and quite frankly, I haven't seen a ton coming, you know, a ton coming out of Sprint either specifically, but uh, you know, there have definitely been a handful uh, but again, I think it's just right for opportunity to do that. And, I, and, and in order to do that, you know, you got to create this whole um, entrepreneurial ecosystem around it to draw people out, to make sure that they know that, hey, if I roll out of these companies, there's, there's, a lot, there's plenty of support to help me grow my business. Um, and I think that's a message that we're trying to kind of get out is, hey, you know what, there, there is a ton of support out here. You know, take the take the leap. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> take the take the leap out and uh, and go for it because it's uh, you know again it's a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, it's a very different environment, obviously, than a corporate experience. But uh, but again, there are tons of opportunities. Sounds good. Um, I'm gonna want to go ahead and give a, a word of thanks to our sponsor, Delta Dental of Iowa, uh, for supporting the show today. When it comes to taking care of your smile, rely on a company you can trust. Fact is, more Iowans trust their smiles to Delta Dental. Whether you're looking for a dental policy for you, your family, or your startup, visit deltadentalia.com to learn more about your many plan options. Uh, Chris, this is the point in the show where you make a joke about the smile cam. And we usually it's <laughs> Iowa State, but I know you're a big Hawkeye fan, so I'm sure you guys have the smile cam over <laughs> in Iowa City, too. So, um, Okay, uh, that leads us into the Fast Four, and I think you guys and know, know how the Fast Four works, but just as a reminder, uh, we're going to cover four topics. I will introduce the topic and end with a question and ask each of you. Um, you'll have a chance to answer, and then I will say who is right or if nobody's right and it's just me. That's kind of the way that we do it. So question number one, uh, through the efforts of the social media strategies class at Drake University, Des Moines is one of five cities to earn its own Foursquare badge. The city now has an official list of 30, well, I think it was 36 I saw today. It's 36 now. 36 <laughs> venues to see in Des Moines. Which venue is the most interesting in your opinion? And Chris, I'll start with you since you had a part in making the list. Uh, actually, I think it's uh, number 36, which was supposed to be on from the beginning and, and somehow didn't get on there, the, the Papa John Sculpture Garden, which I think, you know, really, you know, made that, uh, you know, that west end of downtown its own little area, you know, kind of brought that back mm -hmm. six years ago. It was really, you know, nothing down there. Yeah. Fair enough. Thad, what, is, uh, what do you think the most interesting venue in Des Moines is? I think from the list, I was looking for a Chick-fil-A, since that's one of my favorites. <laughs> I did see that on there. So, uh, so I will go with, uh, I'll go with what really drives entrepreneurs and, uh, and businesses, which are the coffee shops and, uh, and the bars. So I saw Java Joe's, Mars Cafe, and El Bait Shop, which uh, <laughs> said that it uh, has the largest selection of beer in Des Moines. So, uh, so I'll go with those three. That, that Sounds good. Andy, what do you think? I wouldn't be a good German if I didn't say Hessen House. <laughs> okay. Uh, another bar uh, as well. Um, I will say the Ray Gun t-shirt shop, so I guess you're all wrong. But uh, the Ray Gun t-shirt shop, just because I think Ray Gun is uniquely Des Moines in what they yeah. do. Um, but I do like all of your answers. And as far as uh, coffee shops, I don't think Amici Espresso is on the list as a coffee shop, which is the entrepreneurial coffee shop. Uh, at least the one that we most often go to because it's in our building. <laughs> uh, and, and they do not sponsor the show. We just drink their coffee. Yeah. Um, and also no Silicon Six. So uh, uh, I know that was my suggestion to you guys. So if that ever can get added, that would Is be... Is it on Foursquare? I looked for it. it wasn't, I couldn't even find it on Foursquare. Oh, as a venue. Okay. Uh, yeah. There is a list of places like start... to stop on Silicon Six. So okay. maybe it needs an actual venue. Okay. Uh, yeah. We'll get that taken. But again, out. it's the students' list. So it was up to them. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, personally, I've done 22 of the 36, which tells me that there's more for me to do in Des Moines. Yeah which is also uh, uh, really exciting. What one were you missing? State Fair or something? <laughs> uh, the gardens at the oh, Test Garden better at Better Homes. But you, but you um, got all the bars, right? I got all the bars <laughs> and coffee shops for sure. 
All right, uh, next story. Des Moines Register's Donnell Eller reported that an anonymous party is looking to put a $1.2 billion data center into either Iowa or Nebraska. And from what the Iowa Department of Economic Development has said, it is not anybody who's here currently, which is Google, Microsoft, and IBM, at least in Iowa. Uh, who do you think it is? Chris, I'll let you start. Uh, I'm going with Zynga. I think they're bringing the, the Farmville Farms you know, to, <laughs> to Iowa farm country. Nice. Very good. Thad, who, who, who do you think needs to put a $1.2 billion uh, data center here? Yeah, I would go uh, kind of have one of two, um, you know, Amazon a, a possibility, and then um, and then one of the banks, maybe B of A or uh, or City. Oh, very interesting, Andy. I'm going with Bob Parsons bringing it home, GoDaddy. GoDaddy, that's an interesting one as well. Uh, in the uh, Register article, she she suggested maybe it was Facebook, the U.S. government, or Apple. I can see Apple. Uh, as they go to Apple. iTunes to the cloud and all that stuff, they're going to need data centers on each in each area of the United States. So that, that would be that makes sense. I, I'm actually I think I'm going to go with you, Andy, and I think it is going to be GoDaddy. I had not thought about that until you said it right there. But Bob Parsons did just invest back in Cedar Rapids by opening mm -hmm. a GoDaddy office uh, sometime in the last year or two, yep. um, coming back home to Cedar Rapids. So I think that that's a great choice. Uh, next up, Jack Perry, the founder of Marion Iowa Syncback. Speaking of GoDaddy, I think his office <laughs> is also, in the same. Well, Jack building. Perry worked for Bob. Bob Parsons. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So Jack Perry, founder of Marion Iowa Syncback Startup, blogged this week about his experience as an entrepreneur. And he listed his first item that he would have would be entrepreneurs think about is, and this is a quote, do people around you refer to you as a visionary? The mean ones might call you an eccentric kook, but the reality is without the ability to see and go after what others don't, you're not likely going to make it. The good news is that energetic employees will follow visionaries for less money than they're worth. Press will follow visionaries and customers will follow visionaries. That I'll ask you first. Is Jack correct? I think uh, I think I would say generally yes, uh, with a couple caveats. Um, I think with uh, you know with any visionary, you have to also be able to articulate the vision and be able to communicate it, and that's not always the case. So, kind of being the uh, eccentric kook uh, sometimes it inhibits you from being able to communicate that vision. Um, so, you have to be able to articulate the vision. And then from a customer standpoint, he said, you know, customers will follow visionaries. My belief is customers will follow great products and services. Um, a great visionary may get you to try a product or service, but to keep on using it, it has to be it has to be one that you uh, are getting a lot of value out of. So generally, yes. <laughs> sounds sounds good. Chris, your thoughts? Uh, you know, I do. I say yes. I mean, I, I agree that, you know, visionaries, people do want to follow visionaries, at least, you know, at least from the employee standpoint, you want to work for someone who you know, has a vision, who has some ideas, who's, who's really going somewhere. Uh, so, in, you know, for me, business is, is really about the people that I work with, people I work for. So i definitely say yes. And Andy? Yes. 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 No explanation? Uh, I think that summed it up pretty awesome. I mean, the, the visionary gets you to follow it, but I think in the end it's the product that wins. But yeah, having a visionary lead you is a good place to start. Yep, I, I, agree, I agree with that as well. He, you are 100% correct on this one. I hadn't thought about the caveat, but that's a great point. Like, um, uh, especially, it sounds like that's what you guys are trying to do with Leap 2. Is a visionary may get you to try Leap 2, but you're trying to have the, the quality of product that keeps you to come back um, time and time again. All right, number four. Nearly 90% of all American Facebook fans for the social bookmarking site uh, Pinterest, which was founded by Des Moines native Ben Silverman, are female, according to a post on TechCrunch this week. Do you think having such a heavily skewed demographic will hurt them as the company go, grows? Thad, your thoughts? Uh, no. Uh, and my reason behind that is uh, I think roughly 50% of the world is female. We'll, we'll, we'll call it that. Um, but that still puts you at about, with a pop, world population of 7 billion, that puts you at a market of, uh, of about 3.5 billion people. Um, I think you can make a pretty good business out of that. And uh, and also, you know, so many companies get get I think so spread uh, across their market. They get too kind of diluted down that if they stay focused actually on that female marketplace, I think it I think it'll still be a huge business and actually could even drive more value because of that. And also largely because of the female population. Um, I don't have any stats to back this up, but uh, but I think the vast majority of them, they're the ones that are controlling the purse strings. <laughs> and so for me, that's a uh, you know that's a big piece of the puzzle, obviously, for any business. Chris, your thoughts? Uh, I go with no. Also, I don't think it's going to hurt them. You know, I my experience working with uh, Juice Magazine here in Des Moines, we were again. I don't have stats, but people smarter than myself told us <laughs> skew the magazine toward women because. Men will still read if something skews toward women, but if something skews toward men, women will not go near it. So 
men will still go to Pinterest, even though it skews more toward women, whereas if there's something out there skewing just for men, the women would not come to it. Andy? That's a great point. I would say it's not going to hurt them. I mean, if you look at companies like Etsy, they're, they're building their entire business off of women selling products to other women, so, and, and they've done pretty well. Very good. I think you're all right. I think the answer is no, and, and appreciate the, the uh, contributions of each of you. Thad, great, great points there as well as Chris and your uh, Juice Magazine experience. Speaking of Juice Magazine, our friend Tim Pollock announced that he is leaving Juice and going uh, a step up in the Register's organization, I guess. Um, and we were talking before the show, you were Juice Magazine editor before right. Tim. So skew towards women, but always had men leading the organization. <laughs> Pinterest has men leading the organization. And I think the majority of Pinterest staff is men. So I don't know what to draw from that. But uh, we've, we've spent our lives studying women, yes. getting, getting, getting to know them. So it all works out. Experts. <laughs> experts. Experts and women. There you go. All right, next topic today, uh, the fiber on the prairie. There's been lots of news in the past few weeks about fiber popping up all over our region. Uh, first, there's obviously the famous Google Fiber Project in Kansas City. They've now announced that they're actually putting in the infrastructure, and they have about 100 people uh, in the Kansas City area working on that. The Kansas City Star, Scott Cannon, reported that they should have the service ready in the first half of this year. A Google spokesperson, uh, Jenna Wandress, told our Michael Stacy that they are still a few months away from releasing their plans and pricing. Uh, but it sounds like something's actually happening with Google Fiber um, in Kansas City. Thad, what's it like to be down there and be, be part of this? Are, are people excited about this still, or is it something that's like so far away? No, I think it's a, I think it's a lot of you know fantastic buzz around it. And obviously, we had this gigabit challenge that uh, I think big partners put on um, uh, several weeks back. Um, and you know, it's, it's a, it's a great rally cry here. I mean, it's a good, it's something to get behind and, uh, it's created a lot of buzz, a lot of energy, you know, <laughs> to be quite frank, people are still wondering, all right, what are the things that are really going to be driven on top of it? And what's going to be the, the value we all, I think inherently know it's a phenomenal thing to have happen. Um, and you know, for me, I, you know, I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm okay with that ambiguity because I think organically they're going to be some, some, uh, you know, fantastic things that come out of it, applications that ride on top of it, businesses that are built around it. Um, so, uh, so no, there's still a lot of, lot of uh, very positive buzz and people are really looking forward to it actually happening. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, a lot of things have gotten cleared uh, from a Google standpoint on actually getting, uh, getting, the, getting that infrastructure starting to be put in. I thought it was interesting in <clears throat> some of the, the, the pieces that have been published lately. I, I was under the impression that Google Fiber would start with businesses and schools and government first, but all of the quotes lately have been about residential um, connections. Right. Uh, is that, that's what you're hearing as well? Yes, yes, that, that is the, that's the first foray is to, uh, is to get fiber to the home, uh, to the residential market. Um, that's, the, that's the focus. Um, you know, I, there have been a lot of questions raised about, you know, which businesses and uh, I know a lot of businesses raising their hands mm -hmm. saying they want to be the first uh, buildings to uh, to be able to get the uh, to get the fiber. But uh, but but the initial foray for Google is going to be residential. Is there um, and I know they haven't released which neighborhoods are getting it. And although everybody really wants to know that, do, do we know, is it just Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri or are Overland Park and like the suburbs included as well? No, I believe it's just the cities. I believe okay. in the first uh, first uh, beginning is going to be on the Kansas side, Kansas City, Kansas, and then it'll be Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, but I believe it's just city uh, city proper. So, do you think that's going to influence uh, where people do their startups and where they locate office space and you know lofts and things like that? Will people move into the city to take advantage of this? Uh, you know, that's hard. You know, it's hard to say. I think uh, I think over time that will absolutely happen, especially if, if there are no plans to expand it outside of that area. I definitely think you'll see a migration um, again, as we just talked about, it'll be largely dependent from a business standpoint on whether they're actually going to uh, it's actually going to be available for business. Uh, but from a residential standpoint, you know, there's so many other variables that come into play on where you live um, that, uh, you yeah, know, that migration uh, could be could be long term. But, uh, but I don't see like a mass exodus, you know, all coming in, all coming into that area just because Google Fiber is plowed in the residential uh, piece of thing. Uh, yeah, that's, I have a city planning undergrad and that's my, mm -hmm. the piece I always think about is this like an opposite of the suburban flight that we've seen, right. you know, from decades ago. But uh, Kansas City's not the only one talking fiber. Lincoln, Nebraska announced this week that they're upgrading their entire downtown with fiber as well. Uh, which I think is really um, an interesting point. And, you know, I think of Lincoln as a mid-sized city, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, Omaha, but it's the next city for there. 
Um, I don't know what Lawrence or Columbia or kind of these other kind of college towns that are within, you know, an hour's drive of Kansas City are thinking at this point, but uh, I've heard nothing about upgrades in Des Moines or Omaha themselves. Do you think we're in danger of being left behind? Chris, I, from your perspective, what do you see? You know, I mean, it, it just scares me a little just because, you know, we hear about people, you know, and I deal with college students and, and they leave Iowa and, and you'd like to keep them here. And you, you just never know what's that thing that's going to get someone to, to want to stay. What, what's that thing that a city has to have to make you stay? So, you know, anything where Des Moines being left behind worries me a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, is the case. Just through happenstance, I've talked with a couple of bandwidth providers in the last week and asked them about these projects. And uh, one thing that they say about Des Moines is that the regulatory hurdles are big here. So um, wanting to extend fiber or connections from one building to the next, you have to get city permits mm -hmm. and you have to get the gas company's permits and you have to go under concrete. And like all of the ways that you actually put that in, like just physically doing it, it's not that there's not a desire, but it's so expensive to just put the infrastructure in place to be able to run, uh, run the fiber um, itself. What Lincoln's doing that's interesting is, to me at least, is that the city is the one that's putting this right. in. So they're going to run the conduit all throughout downtown and then allow the bandwidth companies to come in and use their conduit to, to run it. And I think that's a really uh, neat way to go about it. Yeah, Amos was planning something similar when I lived there five, six years ago. Um, I don't, it never happened, though. They, they were going to buy the actual, you know, do the infrastructure and invest in the infrastructure and then lease that out to, to bandwidth providers. And then they were going to provide, like, a... a a wireless umbrella, if you will, over the campus town area um, as a way to, you know, to attract students and things like that. But it, it wireless, not fiber, though. Well, there's going to be a wireless infrastructure, okay. and then they're going to tr drop uh, wireless networks on top of that fiber back end um, as a way to have all the students constantly connected. Yeah. Um, but never happened. Any any thoughts, Thad? For I, I guess I don't even know what part of Kansas City you're in. I mean, are you going to be able to take advantage of this or? Uh, so I, I work on the Kansas City, Missouri side, or at least I'm officing out of the Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri side, but my residence is down in uh, uh, the Overland Park, Leewood area, so so I won't be able to take advantage <laughs> of it. Um, but uh, but I may just knock on someone's door and walk in and you know see if I can uh, see if I can plug in. That that might be the way to do it. And if we hook up those coffee shops and bars and things that the entrepreneurs hang out in, uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we are That's start true. we are starting to see some tangible like business activity from this. Obviously, you mentioned the Gigabit Challenge um, that, that uh, we've covered and talked about in ProCast in the past, but Kansas City Business Journal reported um, that Google Fiber was in fact a factor, was in fact a factor for Light Edge, which is a Des Moines company, yeah. um, to beef up their office in Kansas City. Signed a three-year lease down there um, for some of their cloud hosting services and, and expanded their team uh, and, and said that it was Google Fiber is the reason why they're doing that. So. Um, we're starting to see that economic impact for, for Kansas Hope, City for sure. Hopefully that incentivizes Des Moines if they see companies going to other cities to, to get these kind of services. Yeah, definitely, and, and everyone. And that was, I believe, always Google's plan with this was to show what could be done mm -hmm. if you had this sort of connectivity and, and encourage the, the world to, to upgrade to that. I don't know if that was their plan. They probably just want to deliver ads faster. <laughs> well, if everybody has this connectivity, <laughs> then they can deliver ads faster and make more money, absolutely. Boy, I tell you, I, I would love to see, uh, love to see these college towns uh, uh -huh. deploying this fiber because I think, I mean, I, the tremendous amount of innovation that would be coming out of that would be just phenomenal. So, uh, so I hope, I hope that's the case. You know, the problem has always been with fiber is just the cost of doing it. What's the business case associated with it? Um, but from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you know, put this in the have fiber in the college towns. Um, I think you'd be, uh, yeah, I think we'd all be shocked at what what could potentially be done. Uh, with those high speeds. Yeah, and the amount of BitTorrent traffic that would be traveling over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was in college in the Napster days, yeah. so yeah, I remember that uh, at much, much slower speeds. Thad, do you know, um, and Danny asked us in the chat rooms, will, will Zave Networks in its current iteration as part of Google be affected by Google Fiber, or is it, um, or I don't know if you even are aware of that at this point. No, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. So again, kind of goes back to the business standpoint. I haven't heard of anything from uh, from the team about them even wiring the building uh, necessarily with Google Fiber. It is on the Kansas City, Kansas side, uh, but uh, but I'm not aware of any plans to do that. And you know, uh, uh, Google does operate uh, does have a pretty decentralized uh, way of doing things. So. So that group is pretty separate from the group that uh, was working with Zave Networks and acquired Zave Networks. So, uh, so I don't know if there are any plans there, but um, but again, since it's a business, uh, I know again the focus is on re on residential. So um, so long-winded way of saying I'm not sure. Okay, and and I think that's fair. Um, do you keep in contact with the, the with the Zave team now, or because you've exited, are you kind of at arm's length? 
No, uh, I've certainly stayed at arm's length, but uh, still in contact with several of the several of the folks there. Obviously, anytime you're building a company, you develop uh, uh, amazing relationships, and there are a lot of great people uh, still there. So certainly keeping in contact with them. I I did notice today when I went to check up on on Zave uh, to see what what's going on that that it now takes you to a Google redirect. And it has, looks like it's been, at least on the web, has been assimilated. It says, click here for more information on Google and takes you to the corporate page for Google. So, um, it has been assimilated to the point of they've retrofitted the, uh, the kitchen area with all the Google food service, which I know everyone enjoys much better than the food service that I supplied when I was there, <laughs> which was barely just beer and pizza at times. So. Uh, well, that's not all bad either. No. So, Well, good. Um, Chris, any more thoughts from you on, on fiber on the prairie or what, what you're seeing? Uh, you know, not really. I mean, if it's a, uh, if it's a business thing there, you know, in, in Des Moines, there's a lot of empty business space downtown and whatever could encourage people to fill that space, you know, and also residential downtown still trying to get people to move downtown could, could make a difference here in Des Moines. Yeah, that's, that's actually a great point. Uh, the building that we're in, there's several startups in the Midland building here and there's a great conference center upstairs. It doesn't even have connectivity in, into it at all. So, uh, <laughs> just getting it within the building would be great. Uh, much less, uh, uh, fiber to all the, the whole area but I yeah that's that's a great point does anybody know what it costs Panora to do that their municipal fiber as far as uh, infrastructure cost um, I don't know and, and what Andy's talking about is there's a maybe an hour outside of town mm -hmm. here Panora has a rural utility district um, it's it's kind of a there's a big lake there and Brad Dwyer who is uh, the founder of hatchlings.com a guy that we talk about a lot and usually watches the show I know he's skiing today <laughs> so um, but he uh, um, yeah, he has fiber to, yeah. to his residence there. I think a big difference from that is when it's rural, you don't have as much regulation right. or, you know, you're you're going under like gravel driveways right. or something, <laughs> not trying to dig up concrete. That's true. Um, so it's easier to put it in rural places if you've got the mass to do it than right. it is into an urban downtown setting. Um, yeah, well, let's, I guess, Andy, let's go ahead and move on to stat of the week. Yes. And I'll it's share the laptop. 169 <laughs> are the number of students that have registered for the Omaha startup job crawl on Wednesday so that compares to 112 for Des Moines um, what time is that Wednesday 5 p.m. probably sounds right um, yeah I'm not exactly sure uh, D Danny Danny in the chat <laughs> right? um, but yeah that's a huge number is that all Creighton or is are there people from Iowa going over there or what's that's that's I don't know um, uh, there might be I, I know but for sure University of Nebraska Lincoln there's a bus coming in of students I think that Nebraska Global might have put together uh, oh, bringing cool. in uh, students from Lincoln to Omaha um, and then University of Nebraska, Omaha, Creighton. So it's, it's for sure multiple schools. I haven't been as involved in this one because it's, it's over there right. as it was in the one in Des Moines. But uh, Brittany Masio from our team putting that together, just awesome, 5 to 8 p.m., she right. says, uh, for the job crawl. But 39 companies, I think, 169 students. I get, I'm on the email distribution when somebody registers a ticket. <laughs> and it's getting to the point where it feels like spam in the inbox because there nice. are so many people registering for the startup job crawl. Um, so if you're a student in Omaha or want to get to Omaha tomorrow, register now. Uh, come on over and check out those 39 companies, lots of startups, lots of other businesses that want to behave like startups and want to like uh, reach that same type of person. So um, uh, very cool event. That's at the Mastercraft building, which is kind of the becoming the Silicon Sixth of Omaha. Like oh. It's the, the focused hub of entrepreneurship. At? You're asking me way too, <laughs> too many Omaha questions. Uh, that uh, it's north north of downtown, like okay, um, okay. In, in that area. But um, yeah, really interesting uh, uh, building over there. I know that that's where Camp Coworking is, and, oh, okay. and groups like that are all located in the Mastercraft. I can show it to you online, but I've actually <laughs> never driven there. So, um, and you, yeah, it was a great. If you haven't, if you're curious about a startup job, Carl, go back and read Rianne's post, which you mentioned earlier. She got a job with Torsion Mobile. Um, I think she'd met them prior to that, but she kind of talks about her experience and what you can do at a startup job, crawl, um and how that worked. Are there plans for that to be recurring or eventually? Yes, actually, we'll be doing one in Omaha, or sorry, in Des Moines, um, I believe coming up next month, uh, another cool. one. So we want to do once a semester in each city. And then I know we have one planned for Kansas City as well, probably, I want to say that's probably in the fall okay. that we have that. But um, right now we'll we're do this Omaha one, Des Moines one, and then do all three um, coming up in the fall. We're, we're into students starting to panic about getting jobs <laughs> mode, so... Yeah, you'll you should see a lot of people coming to the one in Des Moines. Good. It 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 should yeah. I, I expect the one in Des Moines to outgrow the one in Kansas City this next time, as, or in uh, Omaha this next time, as they've just kind of built off of each other. Uh, Danny does say it is just a few blocks from the College World Series Stadium oh, okay. in Omaha. Uh, is where the Mastercraft building is. Um, yeah, so. Uh, I guess I will leave it there with the show today. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us and for Delta Dental for sponsoring. Uh, Thad, where should uh, people go to learn more about you and what you're working on uh, when they're checking online? 
Uh, well, you can go to my Twitter, which is at Thad Langford, or you can go to my LinkedIn profile. Um, those are probably the two best places to, uh, to find me. Sounds good. And Chris, how about you? Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm Chris Snyder, S-N-I-D-E-R, and ChrisSnyderDesign.com online. And your son? Uh, and you can find my son at uh, Real Baby Hank on Twitter. <laughs> so he hasn't been tweeting a lot lately. He's, he's a little sick, but he'll, he'll make up for it. Your son has a better <laughs> social media presence than I do so, <laughs> at, at five months old. Uh, Andy, how about you? You met Andy.com. You can find my blog at gwood.me. PrairieCast is produced by John Thompson of Evolve. Find out more about his services at dmevolve.com. For more on the show, check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash prairiecast. And for all the news and culture related to startups on the Silicon Prairie, go to siliconprairienews.com. And we'll see you right back here next week. Thanks, everyone.